Hello and welcome to Star USA Training. Today is Tuesday, September 20th, and we'll be talking about internal compliance programs. We are recording the webinar. The slides and the recording and any other materials will be made available after the broadcast. You'll receive an email with the link to where to get those. All participants are currently muted. The Q&A feature is available. If you have questions, we strongly encourage using that program to chat with us. There are closed captions for individuals that need them. If you have any trouble, we do use a lot of initialisms and acronyms uh, during these webinars. So if you have any trouble interpreting the closed captions, please reach out to us. We'd be happy to help offline. And there is one CCS credit available. If you email train at starusa.org with your ID number, we'll be able to put that CCS credit in for you. Thanks, Michael. We're Star USA. We are a trade and compliance firm. We provide consulting, advice, training, and services for both in and outsourcing. We assist with a lot of things like audits and disclosures, helping set up policies and procedures. We also do a lot of things like HTS classification, determining origin, helping navigate value, anti-dumping, et cetera. I am Joe Harper. I'm a principal at Star USA and a licensed customs broker. I've been working at Star for a very long time. And with me today is Michael. Hi, I'm Mike Easton. I'm the President General Manager. I am also a licensed customs broker, and I believe I'm nearly 20 years in the business, maybe 19. If you attend our webinars, you're used to one of us doing a lecture on a topic for a while. Today's webinar is going to be fairly conversational. We have some points on internal compliance programs that we want to get across. But we're also just going to talk to each other and have fun. We think this is going to make it easier for you to put in your questions that you have on internal compliance programs throughout. Feel free to post questions, etc. We're looking forward to it. So really, we would need to start with understanding what an internal compliance program is. When we're thinking about framing out internal compliance, uh, we have to recognize what goes into establishing these kinds of programs. So in our context today, we're talking mostly about international trade compliance. That's our business type, and that's, that's kind of who our audience is. But internal compliance programs are those steps that you put in place at your organization to ensure that your business practices are in alignment with all of the regulatory requirements, all of the internal controls, and all of your business imperatives. Regulatory requirements are the way that you ensure that your business practices do not introduce unexpected risk or invite delays or increase scrutiny from customs organizations or even open you up to uh, fines and penalties. Internal controls are there to help you align your stakeholders and avoid errors or internal conspiracies or even just normal confusion that happens every day. So you need to have good internal controls to kind of navigate through a lot of those things. And then the business imperatives are kind of unique to each business, depending on your business type, whether you're a forwarder, whether you're a manufacturer, an importer, or an exporter. And those are the things that help keep your trade practices profitable and help you make smart decisions about what risk you take. You need to be able to weigh those pros and cons within your business and recognize what it takes to operate successfully on that global scale. All three of these things need to be in alignment in order to have a successful functioning internal compliance program. Yeah, I think both of us, Michael, have seen where if you only have two of those three legs, your compliance program is just doomed to fail. Mm -hmm. So if you write a program that has perfect regulatory integrity and sets up all these internal controls, but isn't in line with what your business needs or what your specific company needs, it's never going to happen. And even if it does happen, it doesn't relate to what's relevant to you. So it won't work. No, we've seen dozens of companies over the years that have to make a decision between how they're going to invest their resources. And resources, in my mind, most often equates to time. You've got limited people whose focus is on mm -hmm. trade compliance and how you divide that time up it can definitely be the line between success and failure. Yeah, let alone which voices get a seat at the table. Yeah. If you make it really relevant to your business, then your higher ups are going to ensure that that voice is heard. Absolutely. Just to set a quick baseline, we want to talk a little bit about the import and the export environments. This is where part of that regulatory requirements come in. Now, we talk about the regulatory requirements all the time. Basically, every one of our other webinars is about the regulatory requirements. So we're not going to spend a lot of time focusing on that today, but to set that baseline, imports are really under the purview of 
Customs and Border Protection, and their partnering government agencies, things like EPA, FDA, et cetera. Their key items are your import regulations, which are generally found in 19 CFR, the Code of Federal Regulations, more and more CTPATS, supply chain security, and trusted trader programs are taking an active role in setting up compliance programs and governing how the day-to-day of the regulations plays out. They also have a program that you may or may not have heard of, depending on how long you've been in compliance, and that's the focused assessment program. Focused assessment is their term for the long audits. But they also have handbooks and advice that they use to come in and look at your program. So you can use it to put together your program and make sure that there is something for every single one of those elements. It's like getting the answer sheet for a test ahead of time. It's great. Then on the export environment, you have mainly BIS, but also OFAC, ITAR, and that is the Bureau of Industry and Security, Department of Commerce. You also have Department of State and Office of Foreign Assets. Am I forgetting any, Michael? No, yeah. OFAC is under uh, Treasury, so yep. Treasury. Thank you. That's the word I was looking for. Then we have their regulations, which are the Foreign Trade Regulations and the Export Administration Regulations. Those are both in 15 CFR. ITAR, the International Traffic and Arms Regulations, 22 CFR. OFAC mainly operates out of sanction and embargo programs, executive orders, denials, etc. Yeah, the scope for the regulatory environment and, and the reason that we have this on here is to provide some context when people are thinking about how to either implement or to start building their internal compliance programs, recognizing what that regulatory landscape is. And Joe, as you mentioned, federal agencies put out a lot of good documentation that you can use and apply to your business. In fact, we've got many of those linked at the end of this session that you can go directly to the regulatory sites themselves and download those. One of those on there is going to be the BIS Office of Export Enforcement, the OEE, has an outreach packet that covers a lot of the perspectives and considerations that BIS expects businesses to have before they engage in their export transactions. And as a good chunk of that is actually devoted to what forwarders need to pay attention to, what their role is in the transaction, and how they can implement procedures that help protect and help them protect their clients and help protect themselves against any errors or potential participation in transactions that are suboptimal. Yeah. Believe it or not, most of the government agencies that you're going to be working with for international trade really do want to see you be successful. They do not want to get you in a regulatory error. They do want you to be able to import and export in accordance with the regs. Yeah, export especially is a huge initiative in the U.S. and trying to grow export footprints for U.S. businesses. So they definitely want you to succeed. So when we talk about putting the internal compliance programs in place, there's really three main perspectives to have in mind. This will help you either develop your program for the first time or to improve it going forward, focusing on the areas of management considerations, operations, and documentation. And management is all about ensuring and demonstrating that management commitment to trade compliance and ensuring that Everyone in the organization is aware of the company's stance on those things. The operations perspective is about educating and informing all of your stakeholders, whether they're internal or external, in order to execute successfully on your plans. And documentation is about that internal awareness and auditing to evaluate the success of your program and identify those areas for improvement. And we'll talk about each of these a little bit on the next couple slides. So management commitment. Compliance begins at the top, and it is incredibly important that it always have a voice at the top. Your first step when you make a manual or you start a program is just saying outright that we, this company, are committed to compliance, that we are committed to following the rules around regulations, around importing and exporting, and we are going to put in place steps to make that happen. That means that your senior leadership needs to plainly and succinctly endorse compliance, that compliance steps need to be available for everyone at every level of the organization. It should clearly communicate what's going to happen if you're non-compliant. So on the import side, what penalties 
you're looking at on the export side, what penalties you're looking at, both civil and criminal for both of them, and have escalation points for any potential violation. It really can't be overstated how important the management commitment angle is. Every single government agency, when they conduct an audit, this is one of the first things they look for is what is management's investment in compliance? Are they demonstrating that they have an investment? And is that investment shared throughout the the organization? They'll look for that statement. And then they will also look and make sure that it's not just lip service. How is this playing out? Is this mentioned at every single one of your decision-making meetings? Is this taken into account? Does everyone in management understand what their specific role is and how they play in? In the operational environment, in the day-to-day, it's really important to have cross-functional awareness within all of your different departments. That's going to include people on the packing floor, people setting up the orders, people taking orders on the supplier side, making sure that all of the internal stakeholders at a minimum are equipped with that appropriate knowledge and the tools to execute that trade compliance strategy. You need to be able to develop resources that identify and assess your critical risk areas that acknowledge and address each individual's roles and responsibilities within that supply chain. You're often working with half a dozen partners, at least in any given transaction, knowing what they're supposed to be doing is one of the fundamentals to making sure that it happens correctly. You need to create a system of checks and balances that ensure that compliance is being observed throughout the entire supply chain as goods move, as the orders are placed. We find that this is one of the areas where kind of cookie cutter compliance programs tend to lose momentum the most because they don't know what areas are in your unique business and they don't know what responsibilities each of those areas have. A lot of businesses call roles different things. And so employees flipping through a manual may not see their role described or named correctly, and then they'll think, I don't have anything to do with this. And that's not accurate. So you you really, really need to be aware of what every area of the company is doing, and they need to have a high enough level understanding of the compliance landscape to know how their element fits in. And you're right. This is where a lot of compliance efforts will fall apart. And we all know that in the trade compliance universe, there's always a limited number of people that are involved in the process and their ability to recognize all the moving pieces is often stymied. But that's where taking your built-in awareness of the business operations really can come into play and getting buy-in and investment from stakeholders in other departments so that they can help you frame out and explain to people that work in those departments what their roles are going to be. It really takes a, a high degree of coordination across different functional areas to get it off the ground and, and have it actually have a compliance program be useful in the day-to-day. Mm-hmm. Great point. Documentation and accountability, and we kind of stuff them together. They can be two unique things. They both matter. So I want you to really take home both of those words. You need to trust but verify. You have to show that when an action is taken, there are responsible parties, and those responsible parties actually act out their responsibility. There has to be record keeping. There are specific lists of records that have to be retained for every single role in every single function. If you're importing, you absolutely need to have your commercial invoice. You need to have your import entry. You should have your packing list and your receiving records. And I just named multiple different functions within a company that would have responsibility for each of those records. So they need to have those records, but then they also need to make sure that they are communicated to a central location. They have to have evidence that your control environment is functioning and doing what it's supposed to, that you have run your audits and your tests and verified and written down your results and then moved those results into a corrective action and that plan has been implemented. Your documentation is just really important. (laughs) Yeah, and we're going to talk more more about it later on. Yeah, now we got kind of the, the framing understood or at least talked about, we need to start looking at what it takes to actually build out that internal compliance program. And you need to consider at least these areas here, risk assessment and control areas, your records and your documentation, your information and communication, your training methods, monitoring activities, 
audit and testing, and corrective actions. And we'll explore several of these. We won't go into exorbitant depth on each one of them, but it's important to recognize whether or not your program is incorporating all of these elements uh, within it. Risk assessment. This is the process for identifying and managing risk in trade compliance. Also, you know, anywhere else, you always want to figure out your risk. But you also need to perform that risk assessment on a continuing basis. Some of the key areas that you want to look at are your supply chain partners. Who's your broker? Who's your forwarder? Who's your carrier? Who's your suppliers, your customers, your intermediaries, your financial institutions? And this gets really, really important because you have business risks in your supply chain of, you know, if a carrier closes down, then you have to establish a relationship and build new contracts to get your goods carried, that's problematic. If your supplier suddenly has to close, you may lose a key source for ingredients that you really need. If they are non-compliant in some way and are facing penalties, you may also then come under scrutiny. So you want compliant partners who are good actors in both import and export activities. Transaction parameters are things like your classification, your origin, the valuation method that's used, the INCO terms rule that's selected, your packaging, making sure that quantities are reported accurately, and that transportation methods make sense. Transportation complexity, what are the commodities? Are there regulations that apply for specific commodities or areas, your methods of payment, how long of a history you have. If it's a new engagement, there often is additional complexity because you're learning how things work and communication channels. For special trade programs, that's things like the Customs Trade Partnership Against, against Terrorism, terrorism Anti-Dumping and Countervailing Duties, Free Trade Agreements, Drawback, your Chapter 98 provisions. So those are things that give you lower duty rates depending on if they meet specific rules in chapter 98. Export and import licensing, quotas, sanctions and embargoes, anti-boycott. Your organizational factors are things like your management structure, how experienced your staff is, whether somebody is out on maternity leave, product lines, supply chain flow paths, mergers and acquisitions. And then your regional factors are your geopolitical and environmental circumstances. We all suddenly faced difficulties around Ukraine and Russia earlier this year. Regulatory environments and trade relations, and then duties as well as non-tariff barriers. Yeah, there's a, a lot of layers when it comes to assessing your risk. When it comes to evaluating that risk, a lot of times it takes asking some difficult questions or pushing to get answers, particularly when we're talking about supply chain partners, ensuring that you have a functional understanding of each party's role in the transaction so that you can create a reliable evaluation of what sort of risk is being introduced at this stage of the transaction. How impactful is that risk to the overall nature of my international business? And where can I look for areas of, of improvement? Members of the CTPAT Supply Chain Security Program are fully aware of the importance of sealing containers and how far that goes towards protecting the integrity of the cargo while it's in transit. But there's plenty of other areas, beginning with initial contact with suppliers and buyers overseas and what sort of complexity that introduces. Again, if you have a buyer that's in Belarus or in Russia, what sort of risk is that introducing into your organization and how much of that risk are you willing to take on? Yes. I talked through these really, really quickly, but each of these bullets is dense and you could spend a day or more on every single one of them mapping out your supply chain and figuring out which of the areas potentially have concerns and how you need to account for those concerns in your compliance program. So if you don't export, your compliance program doesn't need to address export unless you have clients who ask you specific questions. I just want to piggyback on that point you just made. It can absolutely take a day for each one of these easily. And when it comes to putting your programs together, focusing on the consideration of continuous improvement, mm -hmm. you don't have to have everything perfect out the gate. You uh, won't. 
you need to incrementally improve your compliance program over the course of time and create a stage that you can build from next year when you go and reevaluate or when you learn new information about your types of transactions or when you're undergoing something like a merger and acquisition. That's that's one of the areas where trade compliance often gets left to last in terms of strategic planning. They, they'll cover the taxes and the finance and the how the money moves very, very quickly, but they'll leave actual day-to-day -day transactions for the very, very end for some reason. And a lot of risk can get introduced overnight just because of a change in leadership or management structure that has not properly considered each of these parameters. That's a really good point that you brought up. You do not want to let perfect be the enemy of good when you're implementing a program. And that is a spot that we see most of the intimidation factor come in from people who are trying to set up a program in their company. They look at it and they say, we are so far from this. Or they think, I need to have this really complicated, dense, intense program. You don't necessarily. It is very dependent on the needs of your specific situation and the risks of that situation. And doing this risk exercise is very beneficial because you can even go through then and rank which risks are the most dangerous to you and which ones are the highest likelihood to happen. Tailor your program to start there and then iterate from there and go toward addressing the medium risks. And then eventually when you're perfect in all the other areas, go toward the very low risk element. And one of the tools that helps you identify some of those risk factors are going to be things like your ACE reports for importers and exporters. If you're importing, that import activity is being collected through the automated commercial environment, ACE, and you can pull reports on your import activity and get something of a roadmap to where your highest risk areas are. And you can usually quantify that by either HS classification or by total value or by countries of origin, a couple of different vectors you can use. But that's a really good tool to help you begin the process of recognizing where your risk really lies. ACE is a great tool for import and for export because right. you can look at your export reports and see where am I going? What kind of goods am I exporting? I would caution you not to get fully stuck on ACE. It can be really nice to use it because all your data is right there in front of you, but you will miss a lot of the nuance that you will only get by knowing your supply chain and your practices themselves. Because if you know them, then you can look at ACE and see if those reports are representative or not. And if they're not, then that's an area that you want to address. And not to harp on risk assessment too much, but one of the things that you can do, again, is you're kind of building out your program and, and identifying where your risk may exist, but you can't quite quantify what that risk is, put a placeholder in there. Tell yourself to come back to it later and do a more thorough review and just jot down what you know at, at, at the moment, but like move through each of these so that you can at least begin the process and have that bookmark to come back to. And listen, run this exercise at least every few years, even if you have an existent compliance program, because business practices change, regulatory landscapes change. And if you do not have a current benchmark for what your risk is, you're kind of paddling with a box instead of a paddle. Like you're, you're not using the tool for the job. It's a good analogy. Like Thanks. <laughs> Battling with a box. <laughs> okay. I kind of mentioned this earlier in the presentation, but records and documentation are absolutely critical to ensuring that you can actually have accountability in your trade compliance, internal compliance program. And some of the records that you need to be retaining are going to be any policies and procedures that govern either your trade practices or your relationships with your suppliers and customers, terms and conditions count that universe. These policies and procedures need to be accessible and they have to be applicable to your business. We've seen a lot of people try to implement the cookie cutter type of policy and procedure manuals without tailoring it to meet their business. And it ends up going in a drawer and, and never being looked at again. And we found in our experiences that one of the best tools to combat that, put it in a drawer and forget about it, is to create one page work instruction types of documents that are actually useful, that are derived from maybe a, a more broad-based policy, 
but really kind of get to the heart of what people are doing on a daily basis. Yeah. You want to kind of keep your manual really high level. That should just say like, do these things to follow the rules. But the how-to of it is a living document that everybody knows about that gets edited regularly. Another thing that you need to retain are your transaction records. These records are going to provide all of the evidentiary needs in the case of a federal audit or in the case of an internal audit that you're conducting or a review of your transactions. And these records need to be should be complete. And by law, you're required to retain them for at least five years from the date of the import or export. You may need to keep them longer depending on special circumstances like drawback or ABCBD and various other things. But effectively, those transaction records are the real. This is what actually happened, or at least how it was presented, and should be able to paint the picture without any other context. And we use transaction records quite frequently to identify gaps in people's compliance programs, either in instructions being provided to the broker so that the entry is not actually in conformance with what was intended, or the supplier documentation is deficient and needs to be addressed. And those transaction records really help paint a very accurate picture of where the problems may lie. One thing that people often miss is record keeping penalties are pretty stiff. On import, it's $10,000 per violation. So you want to just keep your records. It's an easy win. And you get to keep them in the original format. For importers and exporters, but primarily importers, the broker filing the entry should be able to provide you with a complete document packet, an entry packet that contains all the information that was used for the purposes of filing entry, which is very, very relevant when it comes to customs audit risk potential there. And you want to keep those records yourselves, not just expect the broker to have them. You want to have your own copies of those records. Yeah, because the regulations don't say that the broker keeps them. The regulations say that you do. And if customs finds out that you don't have them, they put on this special lecture voice and they say, <laughs> mm, let me read that regulation to you. Ah, the importer must keep all of this. I don't see the word broker in here. So I've sat through a few of those on behalf of our clients and it's not a fun lecture. No, the lecture voice is great. Joe, Joe has a great lecture voice as well. Oh, family. Curious. Okay, moving on. Training materials. This one's absolutely key. Obviously, StarUSA is very big on the concept of training and knowledge, and we very much want everyone to understand all of the things all the time. That's not necessarily viable in most universes, but one of the recommendations that we have for training, we'll talk more about training in a minute. You want these to be tailored to each functional area within your business to explain the relevant controls and the methods and practices that you have going on. You can't cover all the things for all the people all the time. Do you make your warehouse guys sit through your purchasing instructions? (laughs) They're going to think, why am I here? This doesn't matter to me. And they will be completely tuned out by the time you get to their part. And same for your purchasing guy and your corporate management. Nobody wants to have to listen to the parts that don't apply to them. Audit results. All internal compliance programs are going to have a means for auditing and evaluating trade practices. The more formal, the better generally in terms Mm -hmm. of being able to address gaps. But to whatever degree you have an audit program, you definitely want to be maintaining those records to create that roadmap for future you or future people in this role, or for people that are helping out with the actual transactional day-to-day, to have these audit results available and applicable to what your existing business practices are. Yeah, we talk kind of- sometimes about bus proofing, and it's a really morbid thing where uh, if, if somebody was hit by a bus tomorrow, can your company pick up and keep moving? And obviously we want you to stay around and we want ourselves to stay around. But having that mentality in mind as you're going forward is going to make you more successful. And it's going to mean that you just automatically keep all your records, document all your audits, because it may not be you. I think we want to move towards lottery proofing or something equivalent to that. (laughs) It's a positive, not a hit by the bus. (laughs) The audit results kind of lead into your corrective actions. You definitely want to have that record of corrective actions that were taken and how they were implemented, how they arose in the first place and why they were identified. But a document trail of your corrective actions is one of the best ways to mitigate any sort of penalty. It helps demonstrate your culture of improvement and reinforce the core intentions of your internal compliance program. And it demonstrates that to the people that work at your company, to your supply chain partners, whether they're suppliers, whether they're brokers or forwarders, and it demonstrates it to the federal agencies that come looking. Corrective actions are a big deal. 
They really are. The training programs, we talked a little bit about these, but in general, your training needs to be effective. You do not want to just take generic content and put it on your company intranet and say, all right, everybody watch this and then write me an email that says you did. Your key people, they are all very busy with their jobs. So are you. You want training on compliance to be meaningful. And ideally, the training topics that you choose, training should happen annually at a minimum. So you should be choosing training topics that are identified from gaps that you've observed over the past year. They should be as succinct as possible. I say as we yammer on for an hour about compliance. They should also be tailored to your practices. If you import 10 containers a year, you don't want to give them a training program that's geared towards somebody who's importing 10 containers a day. It should be relevant to the audience. If you're training your warehouse staff, you want to talk to them about receiving quantity verification. If they make documents, you would talk to them about documents. But if they never do, you wouldn't teach them about how to complete a commercial invoice or fill out paperwork. It's inappropriate and waste their time and yours. And ideally, it's more than a checkbox. It's more than just something that you're doing because it's on your list to do. Now, we're pretty passionate about this because we love training. And Michael and I are even the worst people at STAR to talk about it because we really love it. And we see how much of an impact it has when it's done well. And we also see how problematic it can be when it's done poorly. You have the benefit of knowing your staff and your people and the way that your business functions. So you have the opportunity to create something that not only is relevant, but also resonates with their personalities. We go in and train companies all of the time, and we spend a lot of time up front figuring out what the business practices are, who's going to be in the room, what their roles are, so that we can make the training relevant to what they do and make it address the big risk areas that we see. Also, doing things that work and mesh with their personalities makes such a huge difference. If you have somebody in the room who just wants to get in and out and know the stuff and move on, telling a lot of jokes as you go or having a lot of images on your slides isn't going to be helpful for them. But if you have a silly group, make something silly. That tends to be really beneficial. And then the other point that we think is super important is make training happen as part of your normal workflow. Have it be small and consistent instead of really huge events. One of the things that we do here is our little focus areas have meetings every week, every other week, where they train on a topic that has come up for them in the past few weeks. It's a 15 or 30 minute training that directly impacts the work that they're currently doing right then and is usually done by one of them. So they are familiar both with the work and they get the opportunity to deeply research the solution and the regulation and then present it to their peers, which is great. Yeah. The, the point about involving people in the training that normally wouldn't have that degree of responsibility really gives them an opportunity to understand the material better. And we fully understand how difficult it is to make training relevant. As Joe mentioned, when we do our trainings, we spend time getting to know our audience before we try and stand up in front of them and speak. It's a little bit more difficult on these you know, public webinars because we don't know everybody that's out there in the audience and we put these on YouTube. So the audience can be anybody, but if I'm doing a four hour training, I'm going to spend two hours at least getting to know who I'm talking to. If I'm doing mm -hmm. more than that, I will ask questions of the people to get an idea of where they are in their understanding of the subject matter before I even start talking about it, just to yeah. avoid wasting time. Yeah. I actually find that the shorter the training, the more research I need to do ahead of time because it needs to only hit the really relevant points. And so I have to make sure that those are the really relevant points. If I'm talking at you for three whole days, something in there is going to apply to you. But if I have 15 or 30 minutes, I really need to be intentional about that. 
right. So I'm going to ask you. Yep. Fire away. All right. Relatively new company reaching the five-year mark with export documents for the first time. How do you handle import or export documents once they're past the record keeping requirement? Do you archive them and keep them around just in case? Do you delete them? Do you destroy them? What do you do? The regulatory answer is that your effectively your statute of limitations for concern is five years from the date of export, unless there are special provisions that apply that means that you have to extend it more than five years beyond the date of export. Well, effectively, you are not expected to have them by the government. You're not going to be in violation of any rec regulations if you destroy those records after that point. That may not line up with your corporate policies on record keeping. And if you're looking to uh, establish something internally, I would highly recommend ensuring that whatever that number of years is before those records get destroyed is in line with what either legal or sometimes finance would say about those things. But the back of the napkin answer is that, yes, you can destroy your records after five years. The first thing that I want to say is check all the countries that are involved because different countries have different requirements. So you want to keep an eye on that. So if you're exporting from the U.S. and importing into Canada and you have presence on both of those, you need to be watchful for both of those countries. In general, you can destroy them. Destruction isn't bad once you have crossed off all of those elements and questions. Okay, moving on to monitoring, testing, and auditing. You definitely want to have a practice of observing, reviewing what you're observing, and then identifying what gap you're trying to address or what you're trying to improve. All of your compliance activities and the activities that impact your compliance should be part of the scope of this review. So when we talk about compliance activities, we're talking about the actual direct import and export, those transactions themselves, but also the agreements that you have in place with your customers or your suppliers, things that govern the types of transactions you have, the terms and conditions you have with your brokers and forwarders. Those factors all influence your overall compliance picture, and they need to be considered at some level when reviewing your trade compliance practices. Each audit that you perform has to have some sort of reporting and resolution identified, even if it's as simple as stating no concerns identified and wait till the next audit. Reporting should have identified thresholds for concern, whether that's in tolerance thresholds for service provider performance, or whether it's how communication happens when new product lines are created or, or new suppliers are introduced to the supply chain. Make sure that you have what your tolerance thresholds are going to be written down so that when those are you know, gone past those thresholds, you can take action. You definitely want to be looking for patterns in your information. I know Customs and BIS and Census all look at those data reports and look for patterns in that data to identify potential areas of concern, deviations from prior practices, new importers, new customers, those sorts of things trigger additional scrutiny. And you certainly want to be auditing related to the audience that is dealing with the documentation or dealing with that piece of the transaction. You don't want to be subjecting your warehouse people to supplier-based reviews or accountability for documentation that they have no control over. So some of the stress testing that you can implement in your audits include things like challenging HS classifications, whether they're internal classifications or ones provided by your suppliers, or even just feedback from customers. Put in a, a process to periodically test whether or not the HS classification is still appropriate. Do the same thing with your origins or your valuation processes. Valuation tends to be an area where a lot of trade compliance professionals don't have good understanding or knowledge and tend to overlook how important that value reporting either on the entry or on the sales side can influence scrutiny from federal agencies. Uh, ensure that your supply chain partners are using those same values and that all the things match up. Mm -hmm. And you want to incorporate scenarios into your annual trainings. This is a kind of a hot topic for the previous slide, but if a situation has come up, use that scenario in your next training as an example of a real life situation that you can draw on or use ones that have happened with other companies. And you definitely want to have observation of your ongoing operations, looking at individual transactions in depth as frequently as possible periodically, just to make sure that you've got the entire gamut of that transaction reviewed. I love to put people in scenarios for trainings. I think that it makes the training so much more memorable and it is also a great way for them to get to use their work instructions that they have on hand and show whether those are sufficient or you need to edit them. It tends to be very good. 
how do you go about implementing your internal compliance program? There are a lot of ways to do it, to develop it. We've talked about some of them, but in general, things you want to keep in mind are maintaining that culture of compliance and just making it part of your company. And that's where you as the compliance professional are going to be really integral and that senior management support is really integral. Have them mention compliance in every one of their company talks in some way. Having resources that are assigned to and responsible for certain elements, and those resources are empowered to do that. No one should be given a task that they do not have sufficient authority to make sure happens. Communication, super important for success, and then keep improving your program. Don't feel like it has to be perfect immediately. Just start and keep going. Kind of piggybacking on on what Joe's saying there, company culture is one of the essential elements of having compliance actually be undertaken within your organization with any real effect. It sets the stage for that best version of success that you want to have in your organization. Obviously, violations of any regulations is problematic for your business as a whole. You can lose your import and export privileges and a lot of opportunity with that. You need to have that appropriate environment for fostering and sustaining that internal compliance program. And without that, you won't get off the ground. Empowered resources kind of piggybacking again on what what Joe was saying there. There's no road to successful implementation of an internal compliance program that doesn't involve people who work every day to ensure that that compliance happens every single day. It's not something that you only look at once a year when you do an audit or once every five years when you're looking at destroying records. You want to make sure that that, that's part of every day's impact so that real problems don't have a chance to actually manifest. You catch small errors frequently to Mm -hmm. prevent big problems from happening. And that's where that empowerment comes in by communicating that to individuals that they have a role to play and they can actually impact the company's overall compliance. Yeah. Communication. Everything starts there, whether it's, hey, there's a concern whether you're coordinating a plan for initiatives, you're informing business partners of the limitations that you have, or you're surfacing an idea for future improvements. And you want to have that communication open, not only from you to all levels of the organization, but from all levels of the organization to you. You cannot be everywhere. You cannot see everything. No one can. You need to have partners in compliance within your organization from everywhere. It's really, really important. And they are going to notice and have questions about things. And some of the time, the things they notice and the questions they have are irrelevant and not important, but you want to treat them all with respect and importance because then they are also going to come to you with the things that are super important, like, hey, why is my duty on this entry higher? Or what does anti-dumping mean? Or any of those things. You you want to just create that open door, safe space communication. And continuous improvement. There's no such thing as a company without errors. That company really does not exist. Continuous improvement is recognizing that fact and attempting to be better today than we were yesterday. So sometimes that means filing a disclosure with a government agency. Sometimes that means shifting focus. Sometimes that's rewriting a policy or procedure or editing your work instruction because it had a blind spot or putting in a new person. Whatever form improvement takes, it's important to document both the source of the improvement and the actions that were taken so that a roadmap can be created that others can follow in the future. 100%. These are some of the resources that you can actually leverage for forming your own internal compliance programs. The CVP's focus assessment program that we talked about at the top has the procedures that CVP follows when they conduct a focus assessment. And it provides a good guideline for what sorts of questions they're going to ask, what they're going to expect businesses to be able to provide in the event of a focused assessment. Knowing what they're looking at is just a real good cheat sheet on how to not screw it up. I highly recommend that CTPatch Trusted Trader Compliance Handbook was recently published, I believe in July of this year. 
And Trusted Trader is the evolution of the Employer Self-Assessment Program, the ISA. The people that are looking to participate in the U.S.'s fully-fledged authorized economic operator AEO program, joining that Trusted Trader Trade Compliance Program. There's a handbook published that gives you the kind of guidelines that they expect you to follow. And then CFP also publishes things like the warning indicators for trade-based money laundering and terrorist financing that allows you to get a leg up on recognizing red flags. I mentioned earlier that the BIS Office of Export Enforcement provides an outreach package that kind of outlines the parameters of solid export compliance. There is an export management and compliance program handbook that BIS once published. I don't believe it's currently being bandied about, but it's still out there mm -hmm. for download and review. There is also a self-audit tool that BIS gives you, similar to the focus assessment. You can see what it is BIS is expecting you to evaluate on your export sides and be able to produce upon scrutiny. They also publish like a don't let this happen to you, which is a good little tool that you can use to demonstrate what happens when you don't have an internal compliance program and what the penalties look like and what the circumstances were. They update it regularly and it is fantastic for pulling case studies out for senior management, for your little trainings. You know, a lot of people in trade compliance often have to justify their existence, which is a, a terrible way to be but that's kind of the lot we have. And this don't let this happen to you little handbook is kind of a way to paint the picture should things go really wrong. Mm -hmm. And then there's a BIS form 711, which is an end user uh, end use authorization form that you can implement in your own export practices. The government kind of divides things between imports and exports and they don't overlap themselves between the two. So it's important to have that holistic perspective. None of these are going to talk about what you need to have internally based on your business operations and, and what you're trying to put in place based on where your company is trying to go, but they provide a good kind of a touch point for areas to be considering. And all of these are, will be accessible in the materials. Thanks so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking some of your time to be here with us. This webinar is available for NCB FAA credits. You can send those continuing education credits to us using our email, train at starusa.org. And if you have any questions that you didn't get the opportunity to ask during the webinar, feel free to email us and reach out. We love to hear from you. Have a great day.